senescence is regulated by the immune system, so it's a very tightly regulated system. As cellular senescence cells accumulate, the immune system can sense them and deplete them. And so you can have a situation where you have either too much input that creates too many cellular senescence cells or your immune system is disabled from the surveillance. And so you can have a scenario where now senescence cells starts to accumulate. And um, when we initially thought about sort of measuring cellular senescence in a clinical setting, we were very set on capturing the entire system. So when I talk about cellular senescence, I really mean the entire system, both the cellular senescence and the immune system arm, because as you can see, it is extremely important to capture the entire system to be able to deliver on the ability to change cellular senescence. And so, uh, so we start the, set out this goal of uh, identifying longevity interventions that can change the senescence, so restore the senescence network to sort of the normal state in humans, right? And so um, there was absolutely, so this was about three years ago, there was absolutely zero data to go on. We could not design a study to be able to do this because no one ever done this. So the first thing we did is we measured cellular senescence and immune function in a cohort of 250 healthy participants uh, across lifespan to just even see what's there. So what we found is, as you can see, there is extreme heterogeneity both in cellular senescence measures and in, in immune function measures, um, and uh, somewhat gender specific for the immune function. And so this was really exciting because if we think about being able to change cellular senescence metrics and immune function metrics to have a benefit, the idea that there is a lot of people who have those vulnerabilities in this area suggests that they might, if we can identify the treatment, the treatment might actually be very effective because there is a lot of people who can benefit from that. Broadly, I wanted to kind of highlight the therapeutic modalities that can be used to decrease cellular senescence. By no means, it's an inclusive list. So the way, generally, the way we think about this is we think about them falling into three categories. The therapies can have direct senolytic effects, so they target senescent cells directly. They can have indirect senescent senolytic effects, so you're optimizing the immune system that then targets senescent cells, and they can be preventative. So when we think about, well, at least typically, when you, one think about senescence and depleting senescent cells, you would think the direct senolytic approach would be the best, right? It's the most obvious place to go. Um, we saw something really interesting early on, which made us think that that's probably not the best way to go. And so what we saw is, again, it's sort of in a natural aging study, what we saw is that there is a lot of people, even at early ages, there is a lot of people who have just the immune dysfunction. They, they do not have sort of only 8% of them have, dysf have dysfunction in cellular senescence. So there is a lot of people who have immune abnormality that way precedes senescent cells accumulation. So later, you can start seeing increase in cellular senescence and an especially increase in kind of, you know, the domain where, you know, both are deregulated. But this sort of the signal of immune system dysfunction way precedes cellular senescence, again, suggesting if you're trying, if you're trying to optimize for efficacy and, and improve safety, you don't necessarily want to use direct analytics in patients who don't have senescence problem yet, but you might want to target the immune system instead. And so how one can do that? Uh, there is a number of indirect analytic methods, very hot areas, so there is a number of indirect analytic methods that are being used, and I'm sure we'll hear more about this. One of them is, for example, NK cells. So in this particular study, autologous NK cells were infused in uh, three individuals, so three individual participants. You can see that infusion of uh, NK cells decreased cellular senescence in a dose-dependent matter. So depending on the dose in either three months or six months, cellular senescence was decreased, but then unfortunately it rebounded, showing that sort of delivering these cells was effective but was not sustained. Another way is SGLT2s, was a very exciting study showing that SGLT2 inhibitors can improve, can be senolytic by improving T cell exhaustion, independently of its ability to regulate glucose, Rapamycin, John Manning showed that a decade ago, that rapamycin, again, can target the T-cell exhaustion to improve immune response. Beta blockers can target T-cell exhaustion. And on the preventive front, decrease in mitophagy is essential for establishing of senescence, so things like NAD precursors and rapamycin can also be preventative. So, um, 
so again, to summarize, you know, free classes, like I said, direct analytic is sort of seems to be an obvious approach, but as much as high cell senescence in the, in the peripheral blood may be bad, we also know that low cell senescence is a risk factor for heart disease and cancer. And therefore, we really don't know if decreasing cell senescence to those levels with things like sort of traditional senolytics, whether it will carry the same risk. And so therefore, at least at the current state of affairs, it did not seem like it was a good way to go. So we thought that indirect senolytic approach probably has the most, um, the most rate of success. And again, by providing sort of a more physiologic way to clear senescence cells, less likely to go outside, outside bounds, healthy bounds. And, but keeping in mind that infusion of like immunocompetent cells, for example, might also be transient. So things that restore immune system, let's say by T-cell exhaustion, might be better. And then again, with preventative would be amazing. Like we should all be preventing senescence, right? But in a sort of in a study setting, it would be almost impossible to demonstrate that senescence can be prevented in humans. Therefore, it's, it would be really hard to collect the data. And so um, I want to touch briefly on the immune longevity score that we use as immune marker. Um, so it's a machine learning algorithm that combines a lot of things, but it basically captures the T-cell exhaustion, T-cell production autophagy inhibition. And when we report the CPRX metrics, when we report cellular senescence and immune longevity score as a top value, so first of all, kind of we report that so you can kind of place your, your patient in the, in the category where it needs to be. But then you, we also report on T-cell exhaustion, autophagy, and T-cell proliferation. So again, clinicians can see further down molecularly where the potential vulnerability can be from. And so if T-cell exhaustion is a problem, for example, there might be therapies that can address that. So in the last few minutes that I have left, I wanted to um, show you a couple case studies that will, as, as completely un, unguided the registry was, as completely sort of the, the, study, the open study design was, things will get even more complicated. And I hope we all start to appreciate how this is a really complex and it's gonna get even more complex really fast. So here's a case study of rapamycin. So a participant is a 51-year-old female, um, no comorbidities, metabolically healthy, sort of for all extensive purposes, a healthy participant. Uh, so she went on five mgs of rapamycin. So within five weeks, she started to lose weight. And then by 16 weeks, she lost about 11 pounds. She was exercising and during rapamycin treatment. So this is actually all fat loss. There was zero loss of lean muscle, in case anybody's wondering. And so during that period, there was kind of initial drop in cellular senescence, but kind of basically rebound. So we would say there was really no change in cellular senescence. And there was no change in T-cell exhaustion, which Joan showed was the target of herbomycin. So there was zero change, change in T-cell exhaustion. During that period, she self-reportedly she reported an increase in cognitive function, ability to recover for, faster from exercise, and kind of decrease in general inflammatory state. And um, so then there was a washout period, and then she went on a second round of rapamycin, but this time she went on two MIGs, and there was no change in weight, there was no change in senescence, and T-cell exhaustion was changed by half. So now she went from 20 percentile, which really wasn't high in the first place, now she's at 11. And that response was maintained for up to, I think, 18 months after the treatment was stopped. So this is a persistent change in T-cell. It's almost irreversible, I would say, change in T-cell exhaustion. And so I hope you appreciate how you have the same drug, the same person, but one dose can move cognition and, let's say, BMI, and another dose can move immune function. And so during the same uh, period as she became a client in the longevity medicine practice, she, it was found that she has hyperlipidemia due to elevated levels of ApoB. And so when we learned that, we looked at vascular inflammation markers, and what we found is that at five megarapamycin weekly, her, her vascular inflammation also decreased by almost half. Again, five mega was effective in decreasing vascular inflammation, but not at restoring immune function. And so things will get really complicated really fast, especially if you're looking at multiple endpoints. And I've I hope people sort of who are thinking about participating in X Prize kind of take that message and, and think about it because that might very well be, and this is the same person. This is not population level. This is the same person. 
So things will get really complicated. And then, so what about lifestyle interventions? We all know lifestyle intervention is the easiest way to sort of kind of buy yourself longevity, right? And we know exercise is great. So this patient uh, was a new patient to the clinic, described this picture of health, healthy BMI, exercises, all good things. So molecularly, her T-cell exhaustion was insanely high in the 80 to 100 percentile, same with cellular senescence. So basically, through her longevity protocols were not working. Every test was just high. Whatever she was doing was not working. Uh, she, was, she is an endurance athlete, so she got injured and then was forced to sort of modulate her exercise. And then within a few months, her exhaustion dropped from 100% to 50%. During that same, in that same test, her cell senescence decreased a little bit, but nearly not as much, obviously. Interestingly, in a subsequent test, cellular senescence dropped by half, suggesting, again, that there is this sort of immune system senescence network, but there is a time delay for the immune system to be able to do this. The fascinating thing was that her T cell exhaustion actually went back up. So again, whatever longevity protocol she's practicing is damaging her T cell function. And so we expect that if this does not change, then it's the next test. Her cellular senescence will probably go back up. And so it's monitoring this and being able to see this is really important.